Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A man whose name was Joseph Scriven, he lived in the 1800s. Joseph Scriven had some dreams for his life. He wanted to have a uh, a strong military career, and he also wanted to get married. So he was grew up in Ireland. And in the 1800s, he went to uh, Trinity College in Dublin to pursue his military career. He joined the military, but only for a brief moment, because due to his poor health, he wasn't able to serve. One of his dreams gone. Then he found a bride uh, and was going to get married to her until the night before the wedding, when tragedy struck. She died drowning in an accident. You can imagine this man being broken, his his dreams of being in the military, having a nice uh, military career gone, his dreams of being married, just shattered in in a moment, in a tragedy. Well, he moves after that, he goes to Ontario, Canada, and he becomes a teacher, and he's teaching there, and he finds another woman to marry, except a few weeks before they got married, she got sick and died. If you were to describe this man's life, would you say it was joyful? Far from it. We would say this is a tragic life. We would uh, assume him to be a man who's always sad, head down in the dumps, because everything that he seems to want, everything that he looked forward to is gone. And it wasn't just he could see it writing on the wall, it was gone in a moment. Then his mom got sick, and he wanted to comfort her. So he wrote her a letter. We just read that letter, actually, we sang it. Joseph Scriven was the man who wrote, What a friend we have in Jesus. And it really makes you step back when you hear his life story, and then you read the hymn that he wrote, it makes you step back and go, This man had joy, even despite everything else that had gone wrong in his life. He had joy because he knew the friendship that he had with the Savior. He had joy because he knew what he had with Jesus, eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. This joy comes only from Jesus and our relationship with him. And while we look at what joy is, a lot of times in our world we think happiness, success, leisure, rest, that's going to make us joyful. But then we can see what can happen in an instant and it can all be taken away. So the words of that hymn, but more importantly the words of the gospel, our Savior here teaches us that true joy in this life is our friendship with Jesus. And we learn that in John 15, as Jesus himself teaches us this, this beautiful message about who we are, the friends of Christ. And it even stands out greater because you know, if you know where John 15 rests in Jesus' life. John 15 is on Maundy Thursday. So this is the last night of Jesus' life. He's about to be betrayed, arrested, and then uh, tried and crucified and died. Um, but here, he's spending this whole evening teaching his disciples as he's about to go to the cross what it means for them that he's going to go to the cross, and then what that does for them in their life, what that gives them, that true joy. And that's what he does for us, too, as he encourages us and proclaims to us that joy in our life is with our friend, Jesus. Listen to the words of John 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask, in my my name the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the gospel of the Lord. Jesus, as he's teaching here, and you read through these few chapters, chapters 13 to 17 especially, you see him repeating a few things. To love one another as he has loved us. To remain in him as, and in his love. Last week, it's a continuation of last week's gospel. 
gospel. He, he talked about how he's the vine, we are the branches. As we remain in him, we will bear fruit. You have that idea, too, of bearing fruit. Fruit not just right now, but fruit that will last. All these things Jesus is teaching them over and over and over again. But he has one thing that he really wants to tell them. And the purpose behind all this teaching. It's so that they may know his joy. And that his joy may be complete in them. Jesus wants the, his disciples to have the joy, the joy of the forgiveness of sins, the joy of eternal life, found only in their friendship with their Savior. And we know that they were friends with Jesus. We might think, yes, they're friends. They lived with him for three years. They got to know him on a friendly basis. Yes, they're friends, humanly speaking. But, but Jesus is really saying, no, you, you are my friend. And to think about what that means. To think about what it means to be a friend of Jesus. I have loved you as my Father has loved me. So maybe those disciples, as he said those words, they remembered all the times that the Father had boomed down from heaven. This is my beloved Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. That perfect, selfless love that the Father showed to the Son all the time. Jesus is saying, I have showed that to you, O disciples. That perfect, selfless love. He explains what that love looks like, and he would show it the next day. He says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And he would go and do that. He would pick up the cross and go to Calvary to lay down his life, that his friends, his disciples, would have eternal life. Joy that can never be taken away. This is the joy that he wants for them. This is the joy that they have in him, as they had come to believe in him. And as he would bring it to fulfillment on the cross. Their joy wasn't because of their dreams of a messianic hope, of a kingdom of glory here on earth. No, their joy is found in their Savior Jesus. That he is their friend. Interesting thing about friends. We often find our friends based on something that we have in common. And it can be something as small as maybe you got to know someone because your kids were in Little League together and so you became friends as you went to practice together. Perhaps it's work as you work together, that that work that you have, that's that mutual bond that, that you became friends over. Or other different things, maybe sports, whatever it is. Our friends, when we are friends, we have something in common that brings us together. Think about Jesus. Think about the disciples. There was really nothing in common. He is God Almighty. He has been and he always will be because he is God. They are creatures. He is perfect and holy. Never once has he sinned. They sinned all the time. He is the creator, the one who keeps this world spinning. And they depend on him with everything. There was really nothing in common. And yet, what did Jesus tell them? You are my friends, not because we had something in common, but because I chose you. Jesus chose sinners to be his friend. He came to this earth to become friends with them, and he did so by dying on the cross, forgiving their sins, and bringing us into his family through the word and sacrament. Jesus gives that true joy, that joy of forgiveness that can be ours no matter what's going on in this world. That's important for you and me to remember, that Jesus calls us friends. And that he did it, not us. We often want joy. We want a joyful life. A life that is filled with happiness, leisure, success, whatever you call joy. And we often want to find it. And we look for it. We look for it maybe to find a joy-filled life in our work or in our friends, maybe our children or our spouse, whatever it might be. We look for joy in those things and those are wonderful blessings from God. But when we put our hope of our joyful life in those earthly things, we will be left empty. They can never fulfill and last like Jesus joy does. Imagine if Joseph Scriven had put his only hope in his military career or his, his wives, soon to be wives, would have been dashed to pieces. But instead he had joy because he knew where his joy came from. The forgiveness of sins in Jesus. The eternal life won for him that his Savior chose him and said, You are my friend. That is the same thing with us. Like the disciples, we had nothing in common with Jesus. We were born dead in our sins. And the only thing we brought to our relationship with our Savior is our sin. And yet he took it. And he made it his own. 
and he paid for it on the cross, and now he calls you friend. The one who defeated death, you get to say, yes, that is my friend. I can go to him with anything. The one who gives you eternal life, who lives on, on high and rules from heaven, says, you can say, yes, this is my friend. And that is your joy in life, no matter what is happening. Another neat thing about friends is that often when you're with friends, you kind of rub off on each other. You pick up their mannerisms, and uh, you kind of act the way they do. Maybe not always and completely, but, but you maybe start speaking like them, and they start speaking like you because you have that bond, and you've grow, grown in love for each other. Jesus does that for us, too. As we see this joy in life, the joy that is the friendship with our Savior, and through his word, we begin to speak and act like him, because that's just what happens. And that's what Jesus commanded. He says, love. One of the key words in this section, I don't know if you heard it over and over and over again, is love. How does Jesus want his friends to act? What does Jesus say gives joy in this world? Love. As we remain in his love, seeing it in the word over and over again, how he shows us our sin, but then shows how he forgave it, how he builds us up through, through his word, but then he also wants us to show that to others. To find joy in loving him, or loving others like he loved us. To find joy in keeping his commandment. It's important to see that and to be reminded of that over and over and over again. To see our joy in, sa in our Savior. Because in this world we get bombarded with messages that say different. You're going to hear it from the world, from your sinful flesh and from the devil as he tempts you that God's word is restrictive. It says, don't do this, and only do those things. And really, that's letting you not have any fun in this world. God's word is restrictive and, and hinders your joy. You're only going to be sad all the time. And as we get bombarded by that message over and over and over again, our defenses can, can weaken, and we can agree. And so instead of finding joy in keeping God's word and loving our neighbors as Jesus has loved us, we... We go off and try and serve ourselves, thinking, this will bring me joy. Whether it's a sinful thought, a sinful word, a sinful action, a sinful attitude that serves us. We try and find joy in experience or in joy in some person we think will give us joy, but really, it doesn't. You know how that goes when you pursue those sinful desires. They don't leave you joyful, but they leave you empty, broken, and ashamed. God says, remain in his word. Because in his word, it gives us joy that lasts. And in him, we bear fruit that lasts. And so as we are with our Savior Jesus, seeing that friendship we have with him, that he calls us friend, it makes his word light up and be the desire of our life. So as we get to love someone else, we see that as a joy. Because we see and know what Jesus and how he has loved us. As we get to follow his words, knowing that when God says, don't do this, really it's for our good and it protects us. That's a joy, because it keeps us on the path to heaven. As we see him say, love your neighbor as I have loved you, we see that as a joy. As it allows us to shine with Christ's light into the lives of others. One of the neat things as you look back in Christian history is to see how love, Christian love, has really made a difference in the world. If you go back to the Roman Empire, the Romans did not like the Christians. They called them impious and atheistic because they didn't worship the Roman gods. They didn't think they were very patriotic or civil because they didn't follow the Roman gods and Roman rules. But as you read through some of the letters to the emperors and some other comments that philosophers made about the Christians, you see something really interesting happen. They say, this is interesting. These people, they love. They have one wife and they love them. They have their children, and they love them. They take care of the poor on their own accord because they love them. The Christian love has just boomed in history. We saw it even in Acts, as those disciples went out, and they went into the world sharing the gospel with love because they knew the joy that they had in their Savior. It's these, this love in word and action as we get to point back to Jesus that bears fruit into eternity. Fruit that lasts. Those Christians that were first called Christian in Antioch, we'll get to meet them someday. Isn't that kind of neat to think about? Why? Because they know their friend Jesus. And they're in heaven. 
Maybe all it took was a little act of love that opened the door for one of them to come and hear the message of Jesus. So too with us, those little acts of love that we have, that maybe we don't even think about, but just flow from us in our connection with our Savior, might be that thing that bears fruit that will last as we get to have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus, to give someone true joy, true joy as they know about their friend Jesus. This is how we love. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Now I know, as we go out and we love our neighbor, as we love as Jesus had loved us, it's tough. Because we're still in this world, we're still sinner, and we're 100% state. We live in this, um, with this burden, as a sinner saint. And we know to go to God's word for, for help, to be strengthened in his love, to be reminded about what we have in Jesus. But don't forget about the other tool that our Savior has given to us. The third time, and we hear it for the third time in this section, but throughout his, that night, he gave this promise three different times. He said, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, go to the Father in prayer, because you have a friend in me. He will listen to you. So as we want to bear fruit that lasts, as we want to love like our Savior, because we know that message of forgiveness that brings true joy, Go to your Father in prayer and trust that he will hear you because you have a friend in your Savior Jesus. Go to your Father in prayer, whether it's a burden that you're facing or something that you're afraid of, just like that hymn said, and take it to him, knowing that you have a friend who listens and who is there to help you. Because your joy is in your Savior Jesus. And it's going to last both here and forever in heaven. Amen.